Okay, so we've been talking about natural loops and how we can define natural loops more formally. Now let's talk about how to have an algorithm that can identify the natural loops in a control flow graph. So here is the high level algorithm. Um, we'll first find the dominator relations in a flow graph. Okay, so we already know what is a dominator relation. Uh, it relates two different nodes of the control flow graph. Then based on the dominator relation, it will be easy to identify the back edges. A back edge is an edge whose destination dominates its source. Then we will find the natural loop associated with each back, back edge. We already know how to do that. We know the header of the back loop by looking at the destination of the back edge. And then we also know how to find all the other nodes in the loop. Recall that these are all the nodes that can reach the source of the back edge without going through the head of the loop or the destination of the back edge. And then we will combine the natural loops that share the same head. All right. So we also talked about what is, what do I mean by nesting of one loop inside another? Uh, if the headers of the two loops are distinct or disjoint, but if the headers of the two loops are actually the same, then it becomes hard to talk about which one is the inner loop and which one is the outer loop. And so we just merge them into a single loop. All right. So uh, how do I identify? Uh, the dominators. A node D, recall that a node D dominates node N if every path from the start node to N goes through D. So, whenever you see something like this, if every path from the start node to N goes through D, uh, what you should think is data flow analysis, right? And we have seen similar data flow analysis in the past. For example, we have said uh, we talked about must reach definitions and we say a definition must reach a program point if all possible paths from the start node to that program point uh, has that definition and, which, and it has not been killed subsequently on that path. So similarly here we are, you know, that was the must reach definitions analysis that we have seen in the past. This can be thought of as the must reach basic blocks analysis, which is actually a simpler analysis where we want to say that what are the basic blocks that must reach this program point from all possible paths from the start node, right? And that's exactly our dominator analysis. So I'm going to just set up my dominator analysis as a data flow analysis, and it's really easy to do that. The domain of my uh, data flow analysis is sets of basic blocks. These are the basic blocks that dominate the current program point. Uh, the direction is forward because we are interested in finding all the data. We are interested in uh, finding uh, properties on paths which are starting, which are from the beginning of the program, not from the end of the program. So the direction of this data flow analysis is forward. The transfer function is simple: out b equals in b union b. So uh, you know whatever are the you know whatever is the set of dominating uh, basic blocks before this statement just add this statement to it and that's the uh, set of basic blocks that dom uh, dominate the point after the statement. And in other words, if I was to write the transfer function, then FBX equals X union D. Meet operator set intersection and that's coming from the requirement that it should be present on every possible path. And then the boundary condition is that the out of entry is the start node. Now notice that I'm not saying out of entry is the empty node. I'm initializing it with a singleton set because I also have this uh, nice property that a node dominates itself. I want to capture that. And so even for the entry block, uh, you know, the start node dominates itself. So I should start with that. Okay. So there's an interesting fact about this dominator analysis as I've set up as a data flow analysis, unlike the must reach definitions analysis where it was possible for the, uh, uh, for for things to get killed, you know, here there is nothing. There's only a gen set. We're just adding the basic block, never killing anything, and that lends an interesting property. We can actually compute the fixed point solution in a single reverse post order pass for this particular data flow analysis. All right, so we don't need to actually. I mean, when, when I say the fixed point, you know, we have a, a loop which basically keeps continuing until there's a fixed point, but actually that fixed point will finish in a single scan over the entire program. That means that the maximum number of iterations that I'm going to have to do in my fixed point iteration is equal to the number of nodes, all right? Where each node is executed exactly once. And, and that can be achieved if I do this uh, iteration in a reverse post order manner. 
Recall that when we talked about DFA, we said that the order can improve the efficiency. If it's a forward data flow analysis, reverse post order is the preferred thing. If it's a backward data flow analysis, post order is the preferred thing. But some data flow analyses are guaranteed to actually finish in a single pass if you do it in uh, one, you know, if it's a forward one, then if you do it in reverse post order, or if it's a backward one, then it, you do, if you do it in uh, post order or something like that. And so in this particular case, we are, uh, we are good. Uh, you know, we can compute the fixed point in a single reverse or post order pass. And that's just because of the tra how the transfer function is set up, all right? So what is the reverse post order mean? What does reverse post order mean, all right? So for example, let's understand what a reverse post order means using this particular example. Let's say I have three nodes, A, B, C, and D. And these are the edges, A to B, B to C, A to C, C to D, and then D to A. So what is the reverse post order? Well, uh, what is the post order? I'm going to visit the two node before I kind of visit the from node. And so I'm going to, you know, let's say my post order is going to call A. Then before I actually print A, I'm going to, you know, visit B. Uh, and before I print B, I'm going to visit C because B has an edge to C. And, and so, and then C from C, I'm going to visit D. And so my post order would be first D, then C, then B, then A. All right. And also notice that from A, actually, I have a choice. I could have first visited B or I could have visited C. And if you and you would find that irrespective of which one you visit in your post order traversal, you're going to get the same post order. Because let's say if I see, visit C first, then I visit D. So I'm going to print for D first, then I'm going to print C in my post order. Then I'm going to visit B. So I'm going to, it's still going to be DCDA in my post order, irrespective of whether I visit B first or whether I visit C first. And so in my reverse post order, it will always be ABCD. All right. And so my reverse post order for this particular program is ABCD. Now it is not necessary that reverse post order is unique. There could be multiple reverse post orders for the same control flow graph. In this example, it happened, it so happened that irrespective of which uh, branch you take, you're going to get the same reverse post order, which is ABCD. Okay. And, uh, and so Based on this, I can compute my dominators. And so for A, the dominator is just going to be A itself. That's the entry node. Then for B, it's going to be A comma B. Because if I look at, you know, uh, what are all the paths coming in and then I just do a center intersection of the values on the paths. Then for C, it's going to be an intersection of what is coming from B and what is coming from A. And so it's going to be A, just A. And then also you're going to union C with it, right? So A comma C. Notice that B is not present in C because it's an intersection on both the incoming paths. And on D, the dominators are A, C, D. All right. So notice that dominators also include the node itself. And that's just the property of the dominator relation because it's a reflexive relation. All right. So I'm claiming that this is a solution that you would get with the data flow analysis I had, I had set up. I'm also claiming that you would be able to get the solution in a single pass, in a single reverse post order pass of the data flow analysis, fixed point iteration algorithm. So why does, why do we kind of, you know, what is the intuition that, you know, we can get this solution in a single pass. We don't have to do, we don't have to keep repeating uh, the fixed point iteration. In any case, the fixed point iteration is going to finish in a finite number of iterations because once again, with the same kind of finite height of the lattice uh, property, sets of basic blocks are going to have a finite height. And so, so the semi lattice is going to have a finite height. And so anyway, it's going to finish in a finite number of iterations. But it's interesting that we can say that it's actually going to finish in a single reverse post order pass. And so what is the idea? What's the intuition? Because it's because the potentially dominating predecessors in the reverse post order, the potentially dominating predecessors are always visited before visiting node n. So potentially dominating predecessors of node n are always visited before visiting node n. And with this invariant, we can make sure that, uh, you know, the potentially dominating predecessors of node n have already kind of had their solutions fixed. And now we are ready to compute the solution for n. And so what is, uh, you know, how do I identify the reverse post order? The reverse post order can be identified through a depth first search on the control flow graph. We saw an example where I said that this is the reverse post order. I did this using the, you know, trying to do the post order traversal. And that is not very different from actually doing a depth first search of the graph. 
And so I'm going to show you an algorithm which is going to compute the reverse post order for a uh, graph. Uh, and so, and that's going to be look like very similar to a depth first search. Actually, it is going to be a depth first search, just a matter of how I start numbering or naming the nodes or ordering the nodes based on that search. And so for this reason, RPO or reverse post order is also called depth first ordering. All right. So I'm going to use these terms reverse post order and depth first ordering interchangeably in the rest of this uh, lecture and through the course. So here is a sketch of the algorithm, the depth first search for RPO. Uh, recall in a depth first search, I basically maintain a visited bit for every node. And initially I set the visited bit to false for every node. All right. So I say visited n equals false. And then I'm going to start from my start node and then explore my nodes in a depth first order. I can do this easily using recursion. So for example, I could start with, uh, you know, I could call search entry node. Entry node is the start node. And now before I do that, I'm also initializing a global variable called C, which is to the number of nodes in the graph. And why do I do that? I'm going to use this counter C to basically uh, assign a number to every node. And at the end of my algorithm, these numbers are going to dictate the order, the, the order in which those nodes should be placed to obtain a reverse post order. All right. And so I deliberately pick C equals number of nodes in the graph because that's the maximum number. That's the last number that anybody could have. And so I'm going to identify the last node first, right? And that makes sense. I'm going to, I mean, because I'm starting from the start entry node, the entry node is going to have, uh, uh, you know, all right, no, that's not true actually. So I'm going, I'm not going, I'm going to identify the last node first. And because I'm doing a depth first search, I'm going to, uh, you know, end up in a leaf node and that's where I'm going to assign the last number, right? A, a node which is not going to be able to reach any other non-visited node and that's the node which I'm going to assign the last number and then the previous one I'm going to uh, assign the second last number, the pre all pre even previous one, the third last number and so on and so that's going to give me the reverse post order. If I had done the other way, for example, if I had initialized C to be 1 and then uh, uh, kind of done the ordering and uh, numbering in that way, then I would have got the post order. All right, but I'm interested in the reverse post order. So what's the algorithm? Uh, so I start with search entry node and search is a recursive procedure. That's exactly our depth first search procedure. I just set visited n to true. And then for all the successors s of n, if the successor has not been visited, then I call search on s. All right, so this is exactly the depth first search. And now if I have exhausted all my successors, then whatever is the current value of the counter, that's what I assign to n. So I'm using this global array, uh, a map from nodes to numbers to indicate the ordering, uh, the position in the RP order. And so for this particular node n, the depth first number DFN is C, whatever is the current value of C. And then I decrement C by one. So any time, any time I assign uh, C to the DFN of some node, I also decrement it so that no two nodes can have the same C. All right. And so this I claim is going to produce a reverse post order, which means that the node that is the numbered one, the node that has DFN one is going to be the first node. And I can, I can claim here that the start node will always get number one in this case, assuming that it's a connected graph, uh, because, uh, you know, I'm, I would have visited all the other nodes before I actually uh, come and start giving a number to the start node. And so if I visited all the nodes, I would have decremented C, uh, all the other nodes. So I would have decremented C by that much amount, which is the number of nodes in the graph minus one. And then uh, I would be left with just the number, C would be one at that point. And so the entry node in a connected graph would get number one in this example, in this algorithm. All right, so DFN at the output, DFN will contain the RPO numbering of the graph, also called the depth first uh, ordering number of the graph. Now, notice that it is possible that a node has multiple successors. And sometimes depending on the order in which you enumerate these successors, you may get a different DFN numbering. Now in the example that we had in the previous slide, it didn't matter whether I take this uh, uh, branch or that branch, I would have still got the same DFN numbering, uh, but that was just a property of that particular example. In general, it is possible that depending on the order you picked 
the successors, the DFN numbering could be different. All right. So just to illustrate that, here's a very simple example. Let's say this is A, this is B, and this is C. Now, if I pick B first, then my uh, uh, RPO order would be A, B, C. And another RPO order could be A, C, B. And both are valid RPO orders and they are different because they are, they, and the difference is based on the order in which I chose the successors of node A. All right, but both are valid legal RPO orders. So an RPO order for a given graph is not unique or is not necessarily unique. So multiple RPOs are possible for the same graph. Yeah, so we, here's another example. I just showed an example in the previous slide, but here's, an, here's a more elaborate example. Let's have A, B, C, and let's say I have a cycle between B and C. Now, I claim that A, B, C, and A, C, B are both RPOs orders in this case. So for example, if I start with A, and if I, let's say I pick B first, then, I, then C, then I'm going to get the RPO order A, B, C, right? On the other hand, if I pick A first, then C, then B, then I'm going to or, uh, get the or, uh, RP order. Uh, so I pick A first, then C, and then of course the only third option is B, then I'm going to get the RP order A, C, B. In either case, I'm going to get the same set of dominators. So that's a good thing. It doesn't really matter which RPO you pick. Whatever RPO you pick, your DFA algorithm will finish in a single RPO pass, and you're going to get this uh, dominator solution for that particular uh, so, uh, you know, irrespective of what RPO order you pick uh, for this particular example. So for example, A is dominated by A, B is dominated by A comma B, and C is dominated by A comma C.